All right, if you turn to your Bibles, Philippians 3, 12 to 14, this uh, forms the basis of our thoughts. I'm not going to preach on Philippians <coughs> 3, 12 to 14, but it will be good to... I think this is the sort of the overriding theme of uh, what Alan has had on his heart, Philippians 3, 12 to 14. And I'll just read it. It says, Not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, <clears throat> but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenwards in Christ Jesus. Isn't that lovely? Could live on that for weeks, couldn't you? Just that. Isn't it wonderful? But to sort of illustrate that and to expand that out a bit, I'd like us to turn to um, Judges. Uh, judges, And we're going to just look for a few minutes at a man that I think is... Um, well, I think he's forgotten, really. I don't know many people who speak on Gideon. I don't know last time you heard a message on Gideon, but... Perhaps there's been loads of messages on Gideon here, but I guess that he's somebody that somehow we skip over somehow. I don't know why. But I think he's a great uh, servant of God, and, and through these chapters we can learn so much about uh, warfare um, and the principles of God. Now, if you just look at chapter Judges 6, You'll know that Gideon um, has been hiding from the Midianites. Midianites have come in and they've um, beaten them up again. Uh, they're a thorn in their flesh. And Gideon hides, uh, of course. And then there's a couple of things that happen here. Um, and I just want to outline them. First of all, it's in chapter 7 and verse uh, 10 and 11, yeah, verse, chapter 7, verse 10 and 11. And God says, I want you to go down and attack the Midianites. And he says in verse 10, he says, If you are afraid to attack, go down to the camp with your servant Pura and listen to what they are saying. Afterwards, you will be encouraged to attack the camp. All right, so if you're afraid, take somebody with you. The implication is, is if you're not afraid, don't need to take anyone with you. So what do we read? So he and Pura, his servant, went down to the outposts. To me, the message is, is that Gideon was afraid. Wasn't he? And we all go through that period, don't we? We all suffer that in a way. Fear at different times and at different levels. But we just need to understand that however much we are afraid, we still must not allow that fear to stop us moving forward to what God wants us to do and who he wants us to be. Now, God doesn't want us to be afraid, but our fear doesn't need to be an obstacle which stops us. So we can still move forward in our fear. And that's what happens here. Now, hopefully that one will unlock something within you where you have disqualified yourself for doing this, that or the other because you've been afraid. And there's a sense sometimes as we say, well, I've got to get this fear out of my life first and then I can move forward. I believe we move forward 
even though we are afraid. And that is so important. And we've got this, I would call it, if you're making notes, a little heading, our internal conflict. So there's not just a conflict with the enemy, with what we're facing, but we have struggles inside. We have our own war, don't we, to wage. That's what Paul says in Romans 7. He says, what I want to do, I don't. What I don't want to do, I do. And, and that's Paul himself. So we have our own internal wars. So please don't allow the fear that you feel in any situation, be it in church or at work or wherever you are, to stop you from pressing on and moving forward. I was uh, recently thinking about some famous people, heroes of the faith and all this sort of thing, and uh, there's a lady uh, who was a World War II spy. Funny enough, years ago, I went to an old people's home and I was doing a meeting. I sat next to a lady having a drink afterwards. She was about 96. And I said, well, so what did you do? What did you, what have you been up to? Sort of thing, you know? Been up to a lot of things when you're 96, haven't you? <laughs> she said, well, I was a spy in the Second World War. I'd never sat next to a spy before. <laughs> And I said, wow. So I asked her a few stories. I mean, she couldn't go into too much detail, obviously. She'd be a bit of spy. But this lady, not this lady, but the lady I'm going to talk about now, Virginia Hall, she was a lady who, um, she'd had an accident and she'd had half of her left leg amputated. And she tried again and again and again to get into special operations to become a spy in the army. So she had to go to America and France. Right? She got in by the back door because A, she was a lady, and B, she couldn't walk properly. And she kept going and kept going and kept going and did not give up. And I think the title of this talk, isn't it? Uh, Suzanne, is Never Give Up or Never Give In, something like that. And, um, and the, the Nazis called her the limping lady. So she couldn't hide, really, you know, she's walking around, the limping lady. And she called her wooden leg uh, Cuthbert. <laughs> Nobody here called Cuthbert, is there? <laughs> okay, <laughs> Cuthbert. But she did so many things, operations and, you know, she saved thousands of lives. And one of the reasons why she got to where she wanted to be is that she never gave in. She had nose all over the place. You know, you're a woman, you're this, you're that, you can't walk, you're da, 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 da. all nose, no nose, door closed, door closed, door closed. But she never gave in. And once she was given a chance and she became the the Germans said the most dangerous spy that they'd ever come across, it opened the door for other ladies. And then Winston Churchill said, yeah, we've got to get these ladies in because they perform a very, very important function. And, you know, we do very, very well, don't we, at disqualifying ourselves at stopping ourselves, let alone the enemy that's out there, let, let alone any other situations, we've got to get, oh, you, know, you know the phrase, oh, get over yourself. <laughs> that one. Well, and we know what that connotation is, but actually, spiritually speaking, you need to get over yourself. If you can get over yourself, and you say, I am going to get over myself, then the journey begins. But that's your first hurdle, yourself. You are going to be the one who stops you going forward. Nothing else. It's not the church you're a part of. It's not your theology. It's not the Bible college you went to. It's not your area where you're growing up. It's not your diet. It's not, not, none of those things. It's just you being you, stopping yourself moving forward. So that's the, the internal conflict that we all go through. You see, fear doesn't finish you. 
but giving up will. Fear does not finish you, but giving up will finish you. And so if you felt like giving up, if you have given up, then it may be that God wants to do something special in your life this morning. So that's just the first little point, really. This, this internal conflict that Gideon was coming across because he was afraid. And God seems to choose people who are afraid rather than people who are confident. And if I asked for a show of hands now and said, who is confident this morning? You'd be a bit like, oh, I can't put my hand up. I can't show that I'm confident. But if I said, who's afraid? He's putting loads of hands going up. <laughs> See? Because we don't mind saying we're afraid, but we don't really want to say we're confident. Isn't it interesting how we view ourselves? And the view of who you are and what's going on internally is going to dictate how you move on if you move on. So we've got this internal uh, conflict with Gideon and his fear. And uh, the second uh, conflict, really, is in chapter, uh, chapter 8. Uh, if you just turn over to chapter 8. Chapter 8. So this isn't an internal conflict. This is an external conflict now where factors outside, wherever those factors are, are working against you. And what happens in chapter 8 is they've been journeying, they've been doing this, that and the other, fighting. And he goes up to two places in verse 5, a place called Sukkot, and in verse 8, a place called Peniel. Okay? Goes to two places and he says, My army is hungry, can I have some food? And they both say no. <laughs> Not very helpful, is it? Both say no. And he responds by, by almost fighting back, saying, well, I'm not, not having this, you know. When we come back, you know, woe betide sort of thing. You know, you, you're going to pay for it. But there was no support. Any army that's going forward is going to need fuel, going to need food, going to need reserves of weapons and going to need reserves of troops because you just wear out, don't you? Your men literally die, you run out of fuel. You've got to have a good backup system. Well, David didn't have, uh, Gideon didn't have a good backup system because there was no food around. And I think that is really, really important in your walk and in my walk Sometimes we feel alone. We just sang a song, didn't we? About alone, not alone. And sometimes it's just us and God. Now that is actually a really good place to be, isn't it? Sometimes there aren't people around. You know, when you're at work, when you're shopping, when, wh wh wherever you are, you haven't got the church around you. You haven't got a day who suddenly appears at the Tesco checkout till and start playing his guitar, you know. Oh, that would be wonderful. <laughs> and then Tim, <laughs> then Tim pops up in Esther and, <laughs> and Alan pops up in Liddles and all that. Sometimes it's just us and God. I was in, uh, I was in Liddles recently and uh, I was packing my shopping, minding my own business. And then um, this lady had got all her food and it was coming, you know, and she was packing it away. And the lady said, oh, that would be so-and-so. And I could see this lady was struggling, paying. And uh, she was all in a fluster and all that. And I heard the lady at the checkout till say, well, do you want to put it, we'll put it in the freezer for you while you go home and get some money. I thought, I'm not having that. I'm not having that. So anyway, so I went out to check out till, And I didn't, I didn't have a clue what the bill was. It didn't matter. I mean, it could have been 150 quid for all I know. So I just waved my credit card. And I said, look, I'll pay for it. Just, just take it. Go on, I'll pay for it. 
you see. Now, this lady was so embarrassed. She said, no, 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 I can't do that. No, 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 I can't do that. And the lady at the checkout said, oh, do you want to pay for my wages? You know, <laughs> as well. <laughs> and as it happened, it was about £45 or something like that, you know. But this lady didn't take the opportunity that was given for her debt to be paid. And you know, I, I don't know where you all stand with Jesus, but it might be there's someone here this morning you don't know Christ. It might be, it might be. And Jesus, as we'll be seeing when we, we, we share the bread and the cup together, has paid the debt. Isn't that amazing? And we don't say, oh Lord, I don't need this debt. But isn't it amazing that when you're on your own, you can still be the aroma of Christ to people who are around you might be having your struggles you might not have had a quiet time that morning does any of that really matter when we're in the mix with the world and we've got an opportunity to actually overcome our internal conflicts work on our own if need be and touch the life of someone else and that's what's happening here with, with Gideon. You know, there are some wonderful words in Luke 13. If you mark your Bible, mark your Bible. Luke 13. Uh, these are words of Jesus. And I admire. I mean, don't we admire Jesus? But, I mean, goodness me. But in Luke 13, you know, Jesus had lots of opportunities to wiggle out of what he was supposed to do. He didn't even have to volunteer in the first place, you know. <laughs> and um, then he was on the cross, he could have called angels down, couldn't he? And all, all that sort of thing. And Luke 13, verse 31. At that time, some of Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. Now, if you got that message, what would you do? What would you do? Get on the first bus or the first train or go somewhere. And this is what I like about Jesus, is he comes back fighting. He replied, go tell that fox, I will drive out demons and heal people today and tomorrow. And if that's not bad enough, and on the third day, he's really rubbing it in now. I will reach my goal. Aren't we glad that Jesus reached his goal? Verse 33, in any case, I must keep going today and tomorrow and the next day. For surely no prophet can die outside Jerusalem. That little phrase, I must keep going. Ever felt like giving up? I'm sure some of you have. We know people who have given up, don't we? And how sad it is when we meet people who have given up. I was uh, recently thinking of, uh, well, I saw the film Amazing Grace. It's years and years old. But, you know, this slave trade and William Wilberforce and all that sort of thing. And... Uh, it first came to um, Parliament around 1783. Uh, Wilberforce got involved in 1791. Uh, he was born in 1759. So he was quite young when he was involved in all this. And um, he died in 1833, 42 years after... He started with all this abolition of slavery. It took him 42 years. I mean, he, he actually died just before it was passed throughout the British Empire. But can you imagine his, his passion in life was to bring deliverance, release, all that to these people who were being so badly treated. You know, his heart just ran after people who were enslaved. 42 years. I wonder if any of us could be that committed 
to a cause that it would take most of our life. And when Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel, we just read it as a verse in the Bible, don't we? But you know, it's got to get us. It's got to grab us. It's got to be our passion. When was the last time any of us cried and wept over somebody who didn't know Jesus? Have you ever done that? Has God ever touched your life in such a deep way? Have you ever prayed in such a, an intense way that you won't let God go? I will not let you go until you bless me. Familiar words in the Bible? I won't let you go. Lord, I'm going to carry on praying until my parents come through to know you. My dad gave his life to the Lord six months before he died. You know, he only ever got religious. He only talked to me about Jesus when he was drunk. And he was drunk a lot. So we had quite a few conversations about Jesus. And part of me is thinking, go on, go on, Dad, carry on drinking so we can have a good conversation about Jesus. But the fact is, it was a wonderful moment leading my own father to know Jesus. And so don't give up praying for your parents. Don't give up praying for your children and your grandchildren and your brothers and your sisters and anyone else who's in your radar because with God... Nothing is impossible. Let's say that together. Nothing is impossible. So if we can leave this place today believing, watch out world because I'm coming. Watch out office, I'm coming. I'm coming to work tomorrow, so you better watch out. And wouldn't it be lovely when we leave this place, the devil thinks, oh no, ah, Whitford's in danger. The church is on the move. That's what should happen, shouldn't it? So Gideon has, has, <laughs> has come through this situation where he's got no support but God. And that is actually a good place to be. And just, uh, just briefly, the third point really, and, and I love this, in, in Judges 8 verse 4, you read it, Judges 8, verse 4. Aren't these the sort of people you want in your army? Gideon and his... Don't forget, he's only got 300 men here. And he's, and he's beating armies up that have got, like, thousands. Gideon and his 300 men, listen to this, exhausted, yet keeping up the pursuit Are the days gone when you came home from work and uh, actually you didn't come home, you got off at the station, you went straight to church and started the youth club, did the youth club. Sort of, I've met lots of people, I've got to go home, I've got to have a shower, I've got to have a meal and got to, you know, unwind. Ugh. Time you do all that, it's nine o'clock or something and you, you're fit for nothing, you know. God bless you if you do all that, that's all right. But you know, God is looking, is he looking for special people? who are going to be part of his army, who aren't going to worry about all the niceties of life. They're going to keep up the pursuit even though they're hungry, even though they're exhausted. Don't you want people like that on your side? Do you? <laughs> they're the people that Gideon had on his side, exhausted, yet keeping up the pursuit. And even though they were exhausted in verse 4, they still come to these places who don't give them any food. So they're still exhausted and they're still hungry. Nothing seems to change, but they keep going. And I wanted to read a, a, a little bit of... Um, I find Winston Churchill very inspirational. I don't know whether you do, perhaps you never liked him, I don't know. But this is one of his speeches in 1941 when Britain were really going through it. He said, never give in. Never give in. Never, never, never. In nothing, great or small, large or pretty, never give in. Except to convictions of honour and good sense. Never yield to force. Never yield to the apparently overwhelming might of the enemy. It's good, isn't it? 
We stood all alone a year ago, and to many countries it seemed that our account was closed. We were finished. All this tradition of ours, our songs, our school history, this part of the history of this country were gone and finished and liquidated. Very different is the mood today. Britain, other nations thought, had drawn a sponge across her slate. But instead of our country, but instead, our country, you'll like this, Ezekiel, stood in the gap. There was no flinching, no thought of giving in. And by what seemed almost a miracle to those outside these islands, though we ourselves never doubted it, we now find ourselves in a position where I say that we can be sure that we have only to persevere to conquer, to press on to conquer, to soldier on, to, uh, to, to conquer. And that's words of Winston Churchill. You get the idea? Get the idea what God is uh, trying to say uh, to us this morning. John Wimber, you may have heard of him. He was one of the charismatic leaders in the 80s. He led a fellowship at Anaheim in um, America. And he felt on his heart he should pray for healing for his church. That was his, what he felt God was saying. Every Sunday he was preaching healing, preaching healing. And people got fed up with it. And left the church. Started leaving the church. And he was really, and after 10 months he said, Lord, this is, this is not going very well. And, he's, and he, he was really at the end. I don't know if you've ever heard people say, well, Popeye used to say it, didn't he? Do you remember? I've taken all I can stands, and I can't stands no more. Do you remember that? And that's where it got. I've taken all I can stands, and I can't stands no more. I don't know if it was an American accent anyway, but whatever. And, um, you know, people say, I can't take anymore. I can't take anymore. Actually, they can. And that's not being insensitive, it's not being hard, or anything like that. We think we're at the end, but we're not. Don't let anyone tell you you're at the end, because you're not. Because there's always the Jesus factor. That's quite a good factor, isn't it? To factor in to our, I'm at the end. And um, anyway, so <laughs> back to John Wimber. And he didn't take any spinach, but he just kept praying. He kept going. So he had the phone call from this chap, and this, this man said, oh, my wife's ill, Could you come? she's in bed, oh, can you come and pray? And he thought, oh, I suppose I'd better, you know, like that. I've been praying for ten months, nobody's been healed. So he prayed for this woman, amen in Jesus' name, amen. And then he started speaking to the husband, just gen generalities. And over the husband's shoulder, he could see the wife getting out of bed. She was healed. And that sparked off in his church an amazing revolution, an amazing revival. Because one man kept going and didn't give in. And that's got, got to be a message for you and for me this morning. And I was just thinking this morning, were there, Lord, were there people here this morning and you've put something down, you've laid it down and God's saying to you, I want you to pick it up. And I was encouraged over the last few days and uh, um, in fact, I'll, I'll, I'll say it, Ginny's been around my house and um, I've asked her, you don't mind me using this, Ginny, do you? I've asked her to paint, you know that scene, if you want to turn around in the nursery of Noah's Ark, I've asked her to paint that on one of my walls at home. And to see a brilliant artist at work is amazing. I think, Why does she do that? What's that for? Oh, and all this business, you know. And uh, we were talking about, well, writing books and piano playing and all this sort of thing. And, and I finished writing a book um, four years ago. But there was COVID and all the rest of it. But that's not an excuse. It's just a fact. 
and I laid it down. And I haven't picked it up for four years. See, so the preachers haven't got it all right, have they? It's a level playing field here, isn't it? Of course it is. So I felt God saying to me, and an encouragement from Jenny, pick it up again. And didn't the Lord say to Moses, what did he say to Moses? What is that in your hand? And he throws it down, because God told him to. But God also said, pick it up. And he couldn't have picked it up unless he'd thrown it down. And when he picked it up, it became a supernatural instrument, anointed of God, to do all the things that he did. Okay? There was no magic in the thing itself, but God was anointing it. And if God wants to anoint a stick, fine. If he wants to anoint a chair or a building, that's up to him, isn't it? Hallelujah. So you think right now, if you've laid anything down, have you got to pick it up again? Because it might be you have to. Uh, because that's what the Lord is saying.